What's going on ladies and gentlemen, my name is Michael and welcome to Fudge Muppet. Right now we're going to be taking a nostalgia trip into the lands of Cyrodiil. Just make sure you're wearing the boots of Spring Hill Jack because you'll want to remain in one piece for what we've got in store today. The ultimate heist is one of the best Elder Scrolls quests of all time and for many it is their favourite quest in the Elder Scrolls for Oblivion or perhaps the entire series. By Shea Gorath, I have been waiting to make this video for a long time and if you enjoy this this video and want more like it, please do smash that like button. We're going to go through this adventure together, enjoying the story of this quest, covering the lore it involves, and we can speculate on some juicy theories like why is this club and this hourglass so so large and how did they even get there? The quest begins after you've completed all previous quests in the guild storyline and then sold over 1,000 gold worth of stolen goods to the various Thieves Guild fence fenders hidden around Cyrodiil. You're contacted by the Argonian Amuse, who lets you know that you'll be meeting the Grey Fox in guild member Othrello's house. At this stage, you've been sent to meet the Grey Fox in many citizens' houses, usually owned by members of the Thieves Guild who you may not have even realized are part of the faction. These houses serve as as discrete temporary locations for briefing you on your next quest. You've progressed from the high rank of Shadowfoot to an almighty master thief, with no thief ranked higher but the Grey Fox himself. This mythical thief is notorious among not only the Thieves Guild but the rest of the population, particularly those who live in the Imperial City. He is wanted for a laundry list of crimes and had Hieronymus Lex, a watch captain of the Imperial Guard, constantly searching to bring him to justice. until you cleverly had him transferred to Anvil for guard duty in a previous quest. The massive amount of wanted posters all over the city are as spread out and numerous as the hidden presence of guild members themselves, all of whom revere the Grey Fox as their guild leader. Legend has it he has been leading them for the last 300 years. He is a mysterious figure, donning the Grey Cow, an artifact which was stolen from the Daedric Prince of Night and Darkness, Nocturnal. I would reveal his identity, but he will handle that himself in time. Upon travelling to the Elven Gardens district and entering Othrello's house, the Grey Fox is teeming with excitement. This is the big one. This is the heist that will be written about and talked about for decades to come. We are going to steal one of the Elder Scrolls from the Imperial Palace. Are you ready for this challenge? There is no buyer. This is for glory, not for money. Our names will become legend. I also have a personal need for this particular scroll. As for your compensation, I ask you to trust me. If my plan works, you will get a reward worth far more than mere money. Will you do it? Of course you accept the offer and he explains his plan, which makes the reason you needed to acquire some very unique items in previous quests crystal clear. Obtaining these special items made for the perfect build up to this unforgettable quest, so let's explore what we've gathered. Like many things towards the end of the Thieves Guild plot, Sevilla's stone is extremely mysterious. It is the first thing the Grey Fox requires for the heist, and to get it you had to infiltrate a monastery, the Temple of the Ancestor Moths. Here blind but alert retired moth priests go to live out the rest of their lives. The monks possess this magical stone, which has special properties allowing those who can use it the ability to see the future and kind of spy on things in a somewhat omniscient manner. According to the Grey Fox, the Emperor didn't know the monks even had the stone, for if he did, he would have had it destroyed or confiscated and then kept protected under lock and key in the palace. Almost nothing is known about this scrying stone, but it does remind me a bit of the Orb of Vaemina. This glowing crystal orb is similar in structure and also possesses great power, but of course, we do not know if Sevilla's stone has anything to do with a Daedric Prince. Perhaps it is Aelid in origin, or it was simply crafted by and belonged to a sorceress of ages past who was named Sevilla. Sevilla sounds like she would be an Imperial to me if I had to guess. It also makes you wonder why we don't hear more about divination in the Elder Scrolls series, considering all the standard crystal balls that can be found among the general clutter of magic users during the events of Oblivion. One other thing worth noting is that during the Sevilla Stone quest, you can find a note titled, Instructions the Grey Cow. This details the curse of the cow and explains that a triad of moth priests are investigating it, searching for the Grey Fox and a way to break the curse of the mask so that the priests can actually wield it for themselves. The Grey Fox will admit to this. I suppose there is no hiding it from you. 
No hiding. What a joke. My whole life is hiding. Everything in that document is true. My identity cannot be known. In fact, I just told you my true name twice, but I bet you don't remember it. You and I have even met before, when I was not wearing the cowl. To your clouded memory, he and I are two different people. My own family doesn't even know me. I would give much to be rid of the Grey Cowl and its curse. Besides needing Sevilla's stone for the ultimate heist, the Grey Fox will also send you after the Arrow of Extrication, which was only revealed as necessary for the heist due to the intel he gathered by working with Sevilla's stone. Searching for the Arrow involves another unique infiltration quest, which makes the build up to the ultimate heist so much more exciting. You headed to Breville to sneak into the Castle Mage's quarters to then find a secret passage to a huge underground grotto. The area was filled with a variety of magic casting foes, Daedra and even the infamous giant slaughterfish. Eventually you made your way to Fathus Aaron's tower, where Aaron, the mage himself, can be found. He has a lab here and once you track down the arrow, you find it to be broken as only the arrow's head is there. The Grey Fox says he can repair the arrow and thankfully the piece you found was the arrow head, for it is actually shaped like a key, which not only looks incredibly cool but also makes you wonder how it could possibly be used. Shooting a key into a lock from from far away sounds almost impossible, but then again so does stealing an Elder Scroll. You were promoted to Master Thief at that point, before finally being contracted to meet at a new location, this time in a house in Chaden Hall. Here it was revealed that the Grey Fox had used Sevilla's stone to locate one final item needed for his even greater plan, the boots of Springheel Jack. These enchanted boots belonged to a legendary thief that died 300 years ago, and you go to track down the only descendant of him named Jack Ben, who lives in the Imperial City. Your investigation leads you to the family crypt under Jackman's house, which is filled with vampires. Eventually, you reach the coffin with the boots missing but a diary inside. Reading it, you quickly realize that Jackman is Springhill Jack, but still living due to vampirism. He also talks about how he used to know a man who was a great thief and stole from Nocturnal herself, and how he had this thief partner whose name escapes him. Upon leaving the area, Jackman comes to fight you, and after defeating him, you take the boots from his corpse back to to the Grey Fox. These boots grant the wearer plus 50 to acrobatics, allowing one to jump very high. You can ask the Grey Fox about the diary and he finally reveals the truth. Ah, it seems you have stumbled over a bit of history that few in the Thieves Guild ever discover. I am not the first Grey Fox. That Master Thief died sometime shortly after stealing the Grey Cow and receiving Nocturnal's curse. However, Another thief in the guild picked up the cowl and assumed his identity, and the curse. No one in the guild knew it was a different person. Over the centuries, there have been dozens of Grey Foxes. To the rest of the world, he seems immortal and unchanging. I am hoping to be the last. And now we return where we started, to the final task at hand. The Grey Fox has spent more time working with Sevilla Stone, and is ready to explain his grand plan. Capital! I have worked for 11 years planning this heist. Sevilla Stone provided the last bit of information I needed. The Elder Scrolls are kept in the Imperial Palace, behind a door that cannot be breached. Sevilla Stone has revealed a path around this door. You will have to travel the old way. Once used as an escape route for Imperial Emperors, it has been forgotten for centuries. To unseal the entrance, you must sneak into the basement of the palace and activate the Glass of Time, whatever that is. But where is this entrance? In the Imperial sewers. Here is the key for the gate to that section of the sewers. I picked the pocket of Okato himself to get it. My scrying with Sevilla's stone has provided clues, but not the details. I know the tools you will need there, but not the obstacles themselves. The boots of Springheel Jack will allow you to leap to an unreachable place. They will also protect you from a long fall. The arrow of extrication is the only way to unlock the final door. Take them both. Once you're inside the palace itself, you need to find the reading room. The blind priests will deliver a scroll to you there. 
I arranged for the notable Celia Cameron to want to read a particular Elder Scroll. Don't ask how. However, she will be unavoidably detained. You will take her place. Do not speak to the priests. They're blindfolded and will not realize it isn't her unless you speak. As the Guildmaster, I am waiving blood price for anyone you kill during this heist. However, I can't stop the watch from putting a price on your head. What a mission. After he finishes telling you his master plan, he'll give you a written copy of the plans in case you get confused. I've chosen you because you are the best. Good luck. And so begins the best heist quest ever. And while it easily stands alone as glorious in its own right, you can see just how much the previous quests help boost the feeling that you really are a master thief about to pull off the impossible. But the three items you've acquired that are instrumental in the heist are not the only mysterious things you'll need to succeed. First, you must head into the Imperial Palace and sneak into the basement. You'll want to make your way past the patrolling guard over to a gigantic hourglass known as the Glass of Time. Now, according to the Grey Fox's dialogue, he doesn't know what this is, and honestly, neither do we, in the sense of how it exactly works. But we do know that it reveals a secret door in the sewer system beneath the city, a door to the old way. The fact that Empress used this old way as an escape route is incredibly cool, but the manner in which the Glass of Time brings the route to exist again is truly mysterious. When you activate the Glass of Time, a magical effect appears around it, and the quest continues. In terms of how it functions, it seems to me that the old way exists only in the past, or at least the entrance to it does, and you need to alter time itself so that this entrance, or entire areas of the old way, can be used in the present time. Time. We cannot say how the hourglass knew what to alter, whether it can be used by certain people to mess with other aspects of the past, or even the future, or whether some mage invented it for the sole purpose of bringing about this escape route if Empress needed it. I believe if the hourglass could be used to affect the past in all kinds of other ways, then the Empire's dominance would have been more absolute than it was at the time of the Oblivion Crisis. Maybe this hourglass has properties similar to that of the Wooden Dragon Priest Mask from Skyrim, which allowed the player to go back in time before the destruction of the Broman Jar Sanctuary. But why is it so large? Well, if we take a look at the rest of the room, perhaps we could speculate that the Glass of Time used to be much smaller, because it is surrounded by a bunch of other oversized objects. They're kind of hard to miss. There's the giant crystal ball, a giant club, and a humongous chair. What's quite odd, and this could just be a game design thing, in the sense that Bethesda didn't bother with unique designs, but the massive items, including the hourglass, are all exact copies of other smaller assets in the game. Perhaps a mage was practicing with special size based magic, and grew these big items out of their small regular equivalents for some special experiment. I do find it odd that they're all just down in this seemingly unimportant basement which isn't that well guarded. If the hourglass was some kind of artifact of Akatosh, for example, you'd imagine it placed in a more respectable location and not just sitting alongside crates of junk and other miscellaneous storage items. We know that Akatosh is the god of time, and in the Elder Scrolls Online, Alkosh, the Khajiit's version of Akatosh, actually has an hourglass associated with him. It's featured on Khajiiti tapestries, and there's a massive one where you actually find a relic, the Mask of Alkosh, during the Pride of Alkosh quest. You can see this hourglass again when you visit an obscure realm known as the Spilled Sand, or at least it's assumed to be a realm, but others debate that it's a hallucination or trick of the Mask of Alkosh which you use to access it. Anyway, this hourglass is far bigger, but it is interesting to observe this example of an hourglass and a time god being associated. Just like the Glass of Time, nobody knows the true origin of the massive club, the huge chair, and the big crystal ball, but that won't stop Elder Scrolls fans from speculating and crafting theories. That said, none of the theories I've read are incredibly convincing, but they make for good food for thought. One idea fans have come up with is that it may have something to do with Stendar, who according to Varieties of Faith in the Empire, is said to have accompanied Tiber Septum in his later years. Others speculate that it could have something to do with Elysia's Minotaur son, Belhaza, but in my opinion, the chair looks far too large to be some sort of throne, even for a Minotaur. Alternatively, if we look at Elder Scrolls Legends card art, we can see that ancient giants seem to have been far larger in size, leading to theories that some kind of giant that visited 
Chidan Emperor once used these items. Though as I mentioned earlier, the fresh appearance of the items that look the same as their modern day equivalents doesn't really support this. Another theory suggests the items might have something to do with Michael Kirkbride's sketch, Talos Farewells the King of Atmora, though it's wise to remember that this technically isn't canon. Kirkbride also wrote an out of game piece called Imperial Census of Daedra Lords, which states that Sanguine was a regular visitor of the White Gold Tower during the reign of Remen Cyrodiil and helped in the draftsmanship of the Krendali festivals. Perhaps if this is to be believed, then Sanguine's manic tendencies might have something to do with all of these weirdly large items, but at the end of the day, the entire basement scene is just so unusual and remains a big mystery. I'd love to hear your theories about it in the comments section. Maybe the chair was teleported there, maybe it was grown with special magic from a normal chair or assembled down there, but whatever the case is, I just don't see how it would fit through the basement door in the first place if it was taken from somewhere else. I wonder if this is the lousy spot Sevilla's stone would end up in if the Emperor had found it and kept it protected under lock and key in the palace, as the Grey Fox said. So after you activate the hourglass, you head to the sewer entrance in the Arboretum District, traverse through the southeast tunnel, and delve beneath the bloodworks. This gets its name due to the fact that it actually leads under the Arena District, from which there is no direct sewer entrance access. The area is filled with all kinds of vampire foes, undead and aggressive creatures who are all eager to rip your body to shreds with blades, magic, or teeth. It is quite eerie to think such enemies, particularly vampires, live beneath the arena, where blood is spilt regularly and already seeps down into the infamous Red Room training area, and ultimately, it seems, even further. After fighting or sneaking your way through, you'll find the entrance to the palace sewers. Thankfully, we've got the key the Grey Fox took from Okato's pocket. Like the Bloodworks sewers area, the palace sewers are also home to vicious vampires, so try not to get infected. There's even two very rare bottles of human blood down here. Not that you'd want to drink them, I hope. After making your way through the various doors and winding pathways, you will finally come across this strange door to the old way. It looks quite odd, doesn't it? Almost as if using the glass of time just ripped the entrance from the past into the present, causing pieces of the wall to fall out where they were once attached. Entering into the old way, things look quite similar to the other escape route you used at the start of the game before the Emperor was assassinated, but don't be fooled, things are different. Making your way through all the undead abominations, you'll then progress through the lost catacombs and into a large alien room. You'll need to activate two buttons to open the way ahead, and you can just jump onto the ledge that seems slightly out of reach with the help of the boots of Springheel Jack. You'll then progress through an alien door into the Hall of Epochs. The location is still filled with undead, and in the main area you will discover three fascinating Aelid statues, two of which appear to be in the image of large Aelid warriors. The middle one is known as the Keyhole Pillar, which you need to make spin around and reveal the spot that the arrow of extrication must be shot into. But to make that happen, you need to stand on a specific pressure plate that is hard to access due to walls and gates being in the way. After navigating your way around the ruin and to the final Aelid push block, the path to the plate will Will become clear. Alternatively, you can avoid the search for the push block and just perform a massive jump with your special boots in addition to an already high acrobatic skill. Standing on this plate, the keyhole will be revealed, and you'll have one shot to get the unique key-shaped arrowhead into the hole. There's even a prompt that suggests you practice with different arrows because you'll only get one shot with the real thing. Looking up close with console commands is probably not what the level design intended, but the target seems to be some sort of of Aelid meteoric glass, similar to the other stones you see laying around Aelid ruins. It oddly makes a kind of flesh wound sound when you hit it, and upon doing so, the statue raises and the path forward is made clear. As you make your way towards it, the two previously motionless statues come to life, trying to kill you. They are known as Aelid Guardians, although their true origins and the special magic that makes them function are a mystery. If you try to take their weapons, they will merely crumble to dust in your hands. There is a secret method to obtain them by casting a charm spell of 100 points when the guardians come to life, then immediately kill the target and obtain the weapon. Alternatively, you can use a stealth kill and loot the body at the exact moment the lethal attack occurs. It is pretty much just elven though, so there's not much point. But now is not the time for combat. The way ahead is calling out to us and we should remain stealthy, for there is no telling where this door may 
may lead, until you're close enough for it to say you're entering the Imperial Guard quarters. That's right, we've somehow found our way back into the palace and emerge at the fireplace of a room where all the guards sleep. If you think about it, it is a bit confusing considering the sewers are underground and now we're on an upper level of the palace. One can only assume that that alien door led to a fireplace chute that we were able to kind of chimney climb our way up. Or perhaps it's a magic entrance and we have to use our imagination. If we've entered during their sleeping hours, the guards will be in their beds, making the next part of the heist much easier. From here, you sneak and lockpick your way out into the main walkway. Invisibility potions are incredibly useful, but plain old stealth skills can get the job done too. You head left and sneak up into the Elder Scrolls library area, where a palace guard can be found patrolling and picking up these crumpled pieces of paper. You'll need to carefully make your way around, keeping to the shadows to avoid detection, before lockpicking the hard lock that gives you access to the center library area. Take the circular path around to the right and pull the lever right behind the seated blind moth priest. This opens the door to one of the most beautiful and unique locations in Oblivion, the Elder Scrolls Library. It's just mesmerizing, isn't it? With its elegant spiraling staircase and golden colors. Remember not to speak to anyone as they think you are Celia Cameron. Perhaps you should have covered yourself in some special perfume to add to the deception, but apparently it was not needed. The moth priests are quite a curious group, and we really should make a video all about them. Let us know in the comments if you'd be interested in that. I must also admit that I am curious as to who Celia Cameron is. One can only assume she is a member of the Cameron dynasty of Vale. Would. However, her exact ties to the Empire and how she possesses the sheer amount of political sway she has, enough to privately view an Elder Scroll, has never been revealed to curious fans such as myself. After we sit in the reading chair and keep our mouth shut, a blind moth priest presents us with an Elder Scroll, which we can actually read. Don't hesitate to take it into your possession. You are now holding the treasure of the century and it's time to escape. Carefully make your way up the stairs and out the door into the outer corridor area. But instead of heading down to the ground, you'll begin to ascend higher, taking the path to the moth priest's quarters. This has a middle area similar to the guards' quarters, but for the priests themselves. Themselves. However, we can avoid it and simply avoid detection and lockpick our way up into the next level, the Imperial Battle Mage's Chambers. This is where Okato is meant to sleep, and his quarters are filled with various magical items and clutter. You won't find him here, but you'll likely come across his personal guard, Evangeline Benik. This Breton battle mage uses a leveled staff, spells, and a blunt weapon should she discover you. And because the bed in the room is technically Okato's, she never sleeps, and she remains alert at all hours. Stealthily make your way over to Okato's fireplace, where you'll finally escape down a chute beneath it. It is a very long way down, and it turns out this is the main reason you actually needed the boots of Springhill Jack, not just to jump, but to fall and land. Wearing them will cause a scripted effect so you can land safely, though they are sadly destroyed in the process. But you can survive if you have high acrobatics and enough health, and then you can keep these special boots. Turns out you have landed all the way back down in the old way, and there's a door to exit into the Imperial sewers where you originally came from. Making your way back to the Grey Fox through the sewers feels a bit different for everyone. It all depends on your experience. Some people exit out a sewer grate into water outside the city walls. Others enter the basement of the best defense armor store and leave through its front door. It all depends how you want to get out of there. Going back to the Grey Fox, he will be over the moon that you have have succeeded. Have the scroll. I can hardly believe it. The odds were clearly against you. Capital job. Capital. I have spent seven years learning how to translate this scroll. Even so, I will need a while to decipher what I've sought so desperately. But before your reward, there's one last task. Ah, still thinking about your reward, eh? <laughs> I have not forgotten you or your loyal service to the Thieves Guild. You'll just have to trust me. Give this ring to Countess Umbranox in Anvil. Say nothing about me to her. I need to know how she reacts to it. It may provoke anger or tears. If she asks, just tell her a stranger wanted her to have it. Then report back to me on her reaction. 
Heading to the Countess to deliver this ring, a man simply known as the Stranger comes forth. This was a character who was met earlier in the plot as he was needed to forge the letter required to get rid of Hieronymus Lex. This Stranger had always been private and only told you that he's no one to be trifled with. If you asked him about the Grey Fox, he simply told you, Everyone wants to know about the Grey Fox. Grey Fox this, Grey Fox that. He's just a man, not a Daedric Lord. I've heard it all. They say he's immortal because he's led the Thieves Guild for over 300 years. No one ever sees his face, because he always wears that Grey Cow. Oh, and speaking of the Grey Cow, did you know he stole it from Nocturnal herself? You'd think he was Saint Nerevar, the way they talk about him. However, it is now revealed that this man is the Grey Fox, and he has a lot to say. By the power of the Elder Scrolls, I name Emmer Dereloth as the true thief of Nocturnal's Cow. You're the Grey Fox? I've been betrayed! I am the Grey Fox, but you have not been betrayed. But... I am also your missing husband. Corvus. Corvus? Is it really you? Ten years I've waited for word from you. Why did you hide from me? Ten years ago I inherited this cowl from the former guildmaster of the Thieves' Guild. I became the new guildmaster, but I also received its curse. Whoever wears Nocturnal's cowl shall have his name stricken from history. Once I donned the cowl, no one in all of Tamriel could recognize me. With the cow, I became the Grey Fox. Without it, I was a stranger, even to you. You mean you were unable to return? I've stood right next to you, and you didn't even know it. I cried out to you, Here I am! It's me, Corvus! But you just looked at me, confused. You have broken my heart for a second time. I cannot let the infamous criminal mastermind, the Grey Fox, become the Count of Anvil. If you try to announce yourself as Corvus, I will deny you. I will deny you before the Emperor if I have to. I guessed you would say these terrible things to me. That is why I brought my friend along. From this moment forward, I renounce my life of crime forever. I am passing the Grey Cowl of the Thieves' Guild. To its new guild master. The Grey Cowl is now yours. You are the new guild master of the Thieves' Guild. You will find that history has been altered tonight. Such is the power of Nocturnal's curse that lifting it can alter time itself. If Emmer Derloth had not stolen Nocturnal's Cowl, the Thieves' Guild would never have fallen on such hard times. Because of the curse, he was unable to operate in the normal world of business and society. He could only act as the guild's figurehead. That has been undone. If you go to the Imperial City, you will find that the Thieves' Guild has a guild hall on the site of the ruins of Daraloth. Corvus then takes his place as the Count of Anvil again. With the curse lifted, the cow will allow you to do whatever you want and face no consequence. Taking it off will simply confuse the guards trying to arrest you, so all you need is a pair of lightning fast hands to rip the cowl off your head as soon as you're overwhelmed and you'll be sweet. Just make sure you're not in the middle of trespassing, because then you're still trespassing. The identity split means any bounty you accumulate while wearing the mask will stay with the mask, which by the way gives you immense boosts to your stealth and thieving capabilities. You'll detect life within 120 feet, have sneak fortified by 25 points, and have 200 points of feather, making you able to steal more as it decreases the weight of your inventory, and as a result also makes you move faster. Returning to the Garden of Dareloth in the Waterfront District, where you were first recruited into the Thieves' Guild, you can enter the new guild hall that has appeared as a result of history being changed. Time being altered is such a fascinating
fascinating concept in the Elder Scrolls, and this quest does it with the glass of time in the old way, and the cow's curse and the guild hall. The past has been retroactively altered so that the Thieves Guild could operate in a manner more congruent with the rest of society, and upon arriving your new status will be recognized. There's the basement downstairs with a training room, spots to sleep, and many familiar faces. Upstairs on the street level, which is actually barred from the front door, and you could always see this barred entrance, is the living area, and up from here is the more exciting Guildmaster's quarters. Here you have your very own bed, storage chest, and Sevilla's stone sitting atop one of the shelves. It's a nice little spot to retreat to and counts as a free player house, if you don't count all the effort you had to put in to get it. But there there we have it, the ultimate heist is complete, and the guild hall is yours to command. What a sensational quest that is loved by fans for all the right reasons. I know it still holds a very special place in my heart, and if you're watching this video I want you to know just how grateful I am that you help support the channel and share such a strong passion for this amazing game. If you want me to cover any other quests, theories, or topics that pop up in the Elder Scrolls for Oblivion, feel free to share your idea down in the comment section. Our social media links can also be found in the description for those who want to keep up with everything Fudge Muppet, or just just say hi. My name is Michael, thanks for tuning in, and I look forward to nerding out with you again very soon.